So um, I'll just introduce very briefly um, our two speakers this morning, so as not to use up their time. Uh, Mark Beckert uh, from Antwerp is going to be talking about but comparing two collections. And I think that's a really interesting theme, which is going to obviously surface at various points during this, this conference, the, the importance of collections and the differences between collections and what we can learn from a collection as uh, uh, a corpus that we work with. Um, so I'm going to call on Mark first to get us started. Thank you. Welcome. First, I wish to thank uh, the organizing committee for inviting us for this reflection on uh, materiality of the moving image and its history. And of course, a special thank for Monsieur Lemay and his uh, generosity to show us his collection and to let us work with it. Uh, the presentation I will do is a kind of comparison between two collections, but I, I want to a bit expand the matter. And the first two elements of my presentation will be a bit uh, philosophical uh, reflections on what is collecting and uh, what is the relation between science, technology, and society, uh, what I call technological representational competence, I will explain. And then we go over to the Robert Freeling collection, which is a, a rather unique collection in Bel Belgium, the only one with um, uh, this kind of uh, moving image equipment. And then I will go over to the kind of comparison between uh, the Freelink and the LeMay collection. And I must admit, I uh, didn't know the LeMay collection very well. I, I based firstly my uh, presentation on the list, <laughs> but later I uh, did hear that uh, this was only 10% of the collection. So ha I had to change a bit my um, my vision on it and then in, at uh, at last I, I will reflect on some problems and uh, proposals on the collection while my uh, normal language is dutch i will read my presentation here we see uh, some object of the collection of Reeling. And the, the point I will make is that um, there's a problem with showing collections and uh, conservating it. Uh, the Reeling collection speci especially, thank you, is, um, is kind of reservoir for young artists we're using, you, you see that in the mill, for, for installations in the Museum of Contemporary Art. There is nothing, nothing else is done with the collection. And that's one of the problems, and that's uh, why, uh, one of the reasons why I'm here to, uh, as a kind of wake up call to the Flemish government to do something with this unique uh, collection. In the German movie, Werk ohne Auto, Gerhard Richter, as, an student, as an art student, brings up the notable difference between some random selected numbers and the essential presence of the same chosen numbers in a lot of series. Each one of the numbers now not only stays in an imposed relation to the whole set of possible numbers, but is also definitely connected with the other numbers in the set. This tension between accidental choice and being integrated in a set between an apparent contingency and an imposed necessity also characterizes every kind of collecting. Once picked up in a collection, an object is related to two types of necessity. The, re the relation with state of things as a whole in the world outside and its position within the series of chosen items. The first being the world in which the, ob the object has been used the second, a newly reconstructed world, a microcosm, in which it gets a new meaning embedded in passion, an educational project, a function of research, or as an investment, etc. cetera. 
These transgressions can be related to the, reanalyse, to the analysis of the French philosopher Jean Baudrillard in his book, Le Système des Objets, when he states that every object, I quote, thus has two functions, to be put to use and to, to be possessed. The first involves the field of the world's practical totalization by the subject, the second an abstract totalization of the subject undertaken by the subject himself outside the world. In the case of collecting moving image equipment, the choice by which an object is extracted from the world of use concerns the relation with all aspects, aspects of the development of the phenomenon, historical, technical, and social, as well as, as, well as the necessity, necessary limitation of being integrated in a context of a set based on catalogues resulting from a specific strategy depending on the market, the personal ambition of the collector, his or her motives, the available financial means, etc. Every collection should be studied against the background of this twofold tension between coincidence and necessity as a factual state of things related to the possibility of a random selection and an irretrievable necessity. A study oriented, oriented on materiality and material history, however, can open a way to get around Baudrillard's somewhat sterile, uh, sterile opposition between using and possessing, putting objects back to use on a new level of possession. Analyzing collections of cinema devices and media archaeology such as the LeMay, the Vreeling, and other comparable collections, they can be seen as microcosms in the sense that they represent the presence, an expression I borrow from the French thinker Alain Badiou, of a long diachronic evolution in a kind of cross-cut section, which, as we know, necessary is nothing but a selection. The borders of this microcosm, visible or not, do reflect the concept, which can be, first, strictly technical, Secondly, can stress the diversity in certain branches of the process, and third, can accentuate social and commercial aspects, including, uh, including meta-representation of its praxis in handbooks, magazines, paintings, etches, and in photos. It will be clear that comparing the Vreeling with the LeMay collection, the work of Francois LeMay is of more importance on the first and the second level, while Vreeling's interest was stronger in the social and commercial aspects. Mostly, in fact, stud studying other comparable collections, one finds a mix of all aspects. Seen most, col most collections are a kind of hybrid amalgam of cameras, projectors, film stock posters, and memorabilia, depending on the choice, the means, and the luck of the collector as a private person. What is missing in most cases are sound recording devices, editing tables, and laboratory equipment, such as printers and copying machines, studio equipment for set lighting and camera movement. Vreeling is here, as we will see, an exception. So at first, the representation in a microcosm can be reduced to essential, strictly technical and material stages in the development of the medium. In this case, related to three specific domains, which are producing, recording, and showing moving images, eventually including pre-cinema items and optical devices and toys. In most cases, cameras, film stock, and projectors form the core of such collections. Some years ago, some years ago, I made a trip to Germany visiting all six film museums, almost all of them based on this approach. Only the Berlin Film Museum, deviating from this usual way of presentation, showing almost no equipment, as we see here. On the first level of production, Additional, additional material can be integrated, such as development machines, editing tables, color calibrating, and copy devices, each one again related to professional, semi-professional, and amateur equipment. 
On a second level, the collection can be extended from basic technical innovation to the, to the research for diver diversification, the study of technical details in different versions, concepts and brands, paying attention to the translation of professional material in amateur film equipment. A third level regards the social and commercial aspects, such as publicity and merchandising, but also includes meta-reflective aspects as they appear in books, as I told. Starting from the three essential aspects of the moving image, this is first, the analysis of movement, Secondly, fixing the image on a support. And third, the synthesis leading to a reproduction of the movement. One can expand this basic structure to pre-cinema as well as to cinema in all forms, from the phenakistiscope to digital beamers. Within the basic structure, all aspects of pre-cinema are, are already present registration, storing, and showing. The Magic Lantern, as the most important prologue to what later will become cinema, appears simultaneously as a toy, as a non-professional amusement gadget, and as a professional tool, each of it also characteristic for the cinema as a whole. Hybrid devices, such as magic lanterns, equipped for 35 millimeter projection, are interesting examples of this kind of transitions, just like all forms of transformation from one te technique to another. I refer to the construction of the first film projectors based on an adaptation of the camera of the Laterna Magica, magic camera. An excellent example of such a paradigmatic continuity is also the bioscope of the German brother Skalianowski, modeled on the cross dissolves as they were used in magic lantern shows. Aspects of production can easily be associated with the analysis of movement split up in segments as cameras, film stock, light meters, uh, optical printing and, ed uh, and editing devices, sound recording, studio equipment and animation technique. The synthesis, I go back to, the, to this scheme. Distribution as an intermediate uh, section between recording and showing reminds subparts as film stock, film formats, standardization, printing and copying machinery. On an implicit social level, production can be associated with camera manuals and auctions. Distribution, distribution with catalogs and exploitation with posters, ticketing, lobby cards, etc. Every collection of moving image equipment can't be other than a choice, an inductive intervention in this threefold world of historical dev development. The ideal praxis of collecting would be at the same time a diachronic representation of the historical development of the medium and at the same time aiming for a synchronic crosscut. Next to this, I propose to reflect for a moment on the relation between science, technology, and society, starting from a wider view and then zooming in on film. As I see it, the relation between science, technology, and society can be understood as an interaction of three domains. First, science and technology as embedded in the structure of society. Secondly, the development of specific domains as they are embedded in the, in the structure of society. Uh, and third, the science and technology as in the case of, of what the Austrian philosopher Karl Popper calls a third world, invoking and creating new problems and paradigms within their own field of theory and practice. Uh, we, as an example, we can refer to the, what uh, Ian yesterday uh, pointed, that uh, when the cinema camera w was invented, there was uh, in the beginning no uh, big problem how to use it. There, there was no editing principle and so on. So that's what I mean by the third domain. It's, uh, it's a kind of domain which creates its own proble problems based on new techniques. Within the specific domains of techno-scientific praxis, the segment of what could be called pers perspective apparatus can be indicated as the most important. Devices used and developed in this domain are extensions of the brain. 
the memory and the perceptive organs, not only changing the world in a direct praxis, but changing the way the world is observed and interpreted. The use of hammers, knives and steam engines has, ch has changed the appearance of the world. Microscopes, telescopes and cameras changed the way this appearance was perceived and interpreted. As I once noted in an article on this matter, a world characterized by growing speed and velocity, as we saw yesterday, yesterday also in the origin of the city, by trains, cars and telegraphs at the end of the ninth century, needed another way of vision and new means of expression to capture this changing way of life. The moving image was a perfect mirror to reflect this new social dynamics. A movie as Zia Vertov's The Man with the Movie Camera, Chilovic, Eskino apparatum can be seen as a sublime fusion of mechanical dynamic and the new mechanical eye of the kino, leading to the theory of the kino eye. Mechanical dynamic that only, that only could be recorded with a specific type of camera, in this case the legendary debris camera, to which the film can be seen as a hymn. Chomsky, in his theory of transformational general, generative grammar, TGG, uses the concept competence and performance, terms that are somewhat comparable with the saussure distinction between langue and parole. Competence being the set of available means for the speech act of possibility as a possibility. Performance referring to the use of it in an actual act of speech. In the line of this distinction, used in linguistics, one can consider the whole of perspective apparatus as a competence for representation in a certain epoch, each particular representation being a performance of the rep representative system as at a certain time in history. The whole entity of what I would call the technological representational competence in the domain of analog film is then object of for the study of materiality, aesthetics and technological history. Each collection is then a microcosm representing facets of this technological representational competence. Now we'll go over to the presentation of the uh, Vrini collection, which, uh, from which we see here uh, one depot. Problem with uh, this collection is that it is conserved in two depots, one accessible and one completely forgotten, as I will explain. So this is, is uh, the most valuable uh, collection with uh, the, the three cinema items, uh, also with the Lumiere camera and with the first generation cameras. Robert Freerlink, born in 1933 in Bruges, Belgium, studied law and received a PhD in jurisprudence. He earned his money as a solicitor in his hometown as a child, uh, but his passion for film accompanied him for all his life. When Freerlink was a child, his uncle had a cinema in Bruges called Zwarte Huis, Black House. Freerlink, remembering it, is aware that, I quote, the hall where the lights go out slowly, where the gong rings and the curtain rises, has undoubtedly stimulated my fascination for the motion pictures." Unquote. Vreening's fascination for film devices was stimulated when, as a boy, he received an Oymich 8mm camera and projector. With the, pro with the Chulerskip, he went to the US to learn more about the film industry in Hollywood, as he says. For a short time, he worked for the American and the German film industry. During six months, he accompanied the German film crew through Asia and assisted in making documentary films. Due to, to his um, practical experience, he was appointed as a teacher, first generation teacher of a course on film production at Hitch, the Higher Institute for Theater and Cinematographical Studies in Brussels. He really started collecting when there, was, there he was confronted with a lack of material suited for film education. One of the staff members at HITS already had started collecting film uh, television studio equipment donated by the Belgian radio and television. 
This also could have been a stimulus for Robert Freeling to start the collection. Initially, we can presume his basic assumption was ed educational, but while he still the television equipment was property of the Institute, Freeling collected as a private person in his own name. This educational reflex, however, in my opinion, was never abandoned, but Freeling gradually expanded it from a selected public of students to a much wider public of interested people. Together with the broadening of the imaginary public he aimed at, he expanded the spectrum of collecting. All aspects of film production were then integrated. The historical roots of movie making in pre-cinema, professional studio equipment, amateur and substandard cameras and projectors, but also publicity, marketing, merchandising, ticketing, and even stamps. By his death of a stroke in 2000, he left an heritage of about 1,600 pieces, stored in an original depot in Bruges till 2005, when it was acquired by the Flemish community and transported to Antwerp. Due to circumstances, when it was moved to, from Bruges to Antwerp in 2003, the collection was split up in two parts, kept in two different locations. One part of it, mostly containing the smaller objects and pre-cinema items, was housed in a room in the Antwerp Photo Museum. The other part, containing the larger devices, was then temporarily stored in a much larger depot elsewhere in the same museum. This one is the second, somewhere, is the second part of the collection. The, uh, left in the image, you see the. Uh, one page of the catalogue of the Freeling collection. Uh, it's, uh, it's not, uh, it con doesn't contain the 1,600 uh, objects, but only 652, if I rem remember good. But these are the, the most valuable objects containing uh, in, the, in the first room. What we see here is now stocked in the second room. These practical houses pro housing problems will have, as we will see, great conse consequences for the conservation, the perception and the disclosure of the collection. The first part of the collection, containing the most valuable objects in the case of pre-cinema items and first generation cameras, is still housed in the photo museum. The other part, however, was moved in 2006 to a storehouse in the Antwerp Harbour. Since then, professional materials as dollies, spotlights, large projectors, high-speed cameras and editing tables are buried there, waiting to be redis rediscovered. During his lifetime, Freeling took part in several exhibitions lending out items of his collection, mostly related to pre-cinema and animation film, as far as in Japan. In 1994, on the eve of a hundred years of film, he could realize his long-time cherished dream with an exposition in Brussels called Achter het Witte Doek, 150 jaar cameras en projectoren en affiches, uh, I translate, behind the silver screen, 150 years of cameras, projectors, and film posters. This being the first, but also the last time, all aspects of the collection came to light, although in only 131 objects were then shown. Both the LeMay, LeMay and the Freeling collection result from a decennia-long intensive search for moving image equipment, oscillating between the search for almost unique pieces and the choice of iconic devices that mark the development of the medium. A first look at both collections immediately shows a difference in approach. Francois LeMay seems more, much more stringent in his in choice taking some well-known catalog books as a guide, 
focusing on the historical evolution of cameras and projectors, accentuating the mechanical and material beauty of this equipment. Robert Freeling, being more voracious in his project, collected almost everything that could be part of the microcosm of film equipment. In Vreeling's wide angle view, all kinds of mat material could find grace. A Lumiere camera, of course, but also Elizabeth Taylor's dress model in the MGM studios. Sometimes there has been remarked that Freeling's collection is the work of a brocanteur visiting flea marks. It's this wide angle view that at the same time is uh, makes out the power and the weakness of the Vreeling collection, I think. The large amount of secondary material distracting from the focus draws attention to hiatus and the contingency of the collected items and their place in the microcosm. Neither Vreeling or LeMay seem much interested in sound recording. Both were collecting professional cameras and projectors as well as substandard amateur equipment. Here again, Francois Lemay was looking for unique items. Vreeling, the brocanteur, was less refined, where Francois Lemay collected about 2,000 important objects in Vreeling's catalog, only 658 are mentioned. Vreeling, however, purchased more professional material as cinema projectors, editing tables, and copy, even copy equipment. Let's reflect for a moment on how such collection, collections as the LeMay and the Vreeling collection can be approached. From a bio, this can be from a biographical point of view of the collector, trying to connect the content and the set with the ambition and the intention of the collector. This can be from a remediating politic as does the Antwerp Museum of Modern Art with, uh, with to recycle the objects in, in kind of installations. From the viewpoint of media archaeology in the line of the work of Erki Utamo and colleagues, or going out from the technical and material relevance of these devices in function of aesthetics, which I suppose is one of the purposes of this conference. If we focus on the way both co collections are implemented in social context, it is clear that although they are both public property, none of them is pub publicly accessible or part of a permanent elaborated exhibition. Where the collection of Reeling is hidden and stored, only partly visible on the internet. The LeMay collection, however, uh, uh, as a heritage of the Université Laval, is becoming object of scientific, technical and material research. The actual perspective on the Robert Freeling collection is completely different due to circumstances that are in fact could be foreseen when it was acquired by the Flemish community, when it was given in management to the Museum of Contemporary Art. It was immediately embedded in the remediation politics of the museum without any academic ac accompaniment, without any consideration on alternative visions as proves the citation from the MUCA website, only this focus of remediation inspired by collecting lives on nose by Clementine Delis is taken in account. I quote, the antique equipment are an artifacts deserve better, deserve better than to simply be put in the storage as examples of instruments from various episodes in visible culture that now definitely uh, belong to the, to the past. However, the museum prefers to regard the collection not simply as something to be stored, but as a reserve, an area of study, which is not true, for both researchers and artists. Indeed, eliciting new inspirations is precisely the underlying strategy that regularly recurs in MUCA programs. Artists are invited to use the collection to produce an intervention. Not only did a private collection become public property, but a fanciful idiosyncratic amalgam of cinematographic equipment now entered the realm of contemporary art.
as is visible in these photographs of the Muka entrance hall, only picturesque material has been selected to be showed, again accentuating the segment of pre-cinema. This interpretation of the collection as a reservoir, again a quote from the website, also ended a politic of complete completion. As I, as I stated at the beginning of this lecture, a collection is at once a crosscut of an historical present and an autonomic microcosm. It can't be exclusively perceived as a closed reservoir. In the two years I worked as a curator for the collection, we regularly received other valuable equipment, including a steam uh, editing table, as it can be seen in Wim Wenders, Der Stand der Dinge, and a 20th Ger Ger German Ernemann projector. As a summit of irony, I was asked to take the steam with me when I left for an academic assignment the device not belonging to the original collection. Of course, I refused the offer, but some 15 years later, nobody even still knows that the steam bag is not part of the orig original pre-link mi microcosm. The inevitable storing in two locations, one visible, one completely hidden and inaccessible, turned out in a curating politic that only had attention for the picturesque, accessible side of this collection, magic lanterns and the first generation movie cameras. Since the acquisition in 2003, only this, what I would call romantic part of the collection has been showed, but never in the context of a material history of moving image. Even tough, there is some cooperation between MUCA and the Master in Film Studies of the Antwerp University. The, move equip the movie equipment never has been object of research. What I hope, also as a participant of this co conference, is to convince the Flemish Ministry of Culture to broaden the focus on this precious collection, to unlock it in the context of a material research and meet with the wish of the collector, Robert Freeling, of a permanent exposition. I thank you. The idea of having a collection that is accessible is really critical. Uh, and coming from my environment, uh, there are several collections around my area in Los Angeles which are not accessible. And it is a policy of those institutions to sort of squirrel, to put the stuff away, and also the policy that the equipment and some, the, the collecting philosophy is just to preserve in place. And you can't, A, even if they pull it out, you can't, you can't handle it or you, you can't touch it. And my argument with some of these people is we're not talking about a Titian painting. We're talking about a mechanical device that in order to survive needs to be at least periodically utilized and made available most critically for s to study so that people will understand you you know ad infinitum so what what is a solution to that i mean is there any anything for museums or people to to make these things more or to to change that attitude Primarily. I think uh, you're right. Uh, I would remember uh, the context of the Museum of uh, Contemporary Art. The, the objects are now integrated in an art circuit. So, so they are seen as art objects. You don't touch them. Uh, you even uh, can't see them only when they are exposed to a, to a public. That's, that's a great problem. But I think we, we are at the end of an era that, that's the, the analog film, let's call it like that. And I think it's now, now the moment to, um, to, to take conscience of, of our task to uh, collect those things, but also be in a vision 
for next generation, so also collect all facets of, of the uh, stadia in the moving uh, equipment evolution, also sound recording, but uh, also studio equipment, uh, editing tables, and, and so on. And I think the moment is, uh, is broke out, broken out now to motivate the government, to motivate uh, museums to take initiative on, on that point. It, uh, because we are, we are entering the digital era, so now the period is closed. It's the moment to do it. But that's another question than touching the objects. <laughs> uh, I think we, we have to do both. B both uh, organizing expositions uh, in a museum context, and while there are some some objects <laughs> who, that don't are used in the collection, we can use them uh, for research, for experimenting. Uh, with I, I think that could be uh, a solution for the problem. But I, my hope is that, uh, for instance, in Belgium, that uh, that uh, indeed. Uh, people uh, have the conscience and the responsibility, responsibility to organize this for the next generation and not uh, see it as a kind of reservoir for art. <laughs> uh, Marc, uh, tout à l'heure, je ne suis pas sûr d'avoir tout bien... Oui, Marc, je ne suis pas sûr d'avoir entièrement compris le, la conférence. C'est à propos de la comparaison entre... Euh, euh, la collection que j'ai donnée et celle de euh, la collection euh, Vrey Lynch. Euh, vous avez mentionné que ma collection était plus euh, côté brocanteur. En fait, je vais vous donner les deux aspects qui ont dirigé la... Ah, ok, ok. Donc, je n'ai pas compris. Donc, ça, 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 pas compris. Mais je vais, quand même, je, vais quand même faire, je vais quand même faire une précision. Deux des aspects qui m'ont... Euh, dirigé de, dans, la, dans la recherche des pièces. Euh, une première, c'était une recherche des pièces rares, rarissimes, voire prototypes, euh, donc, qui euh, sont en question de format, des formats 11 mm, 17,5 mm, 28 mm, 22 mm et autres. Euh, et également des, des appareils, des conceptions qui ont été des échecs commerciaux parce qu'automatiquement, ces pièces sont euh, rares, rarissimes aussi. Et euh, donc, ça a été euh, ce côté-là, de trouver ces pièces à travers le monde. Euh, donc, c'est un petit peu le, un une des aspects de la, de la collection. Et le deuxième aspect, c'est que j'ai essayé, de, contrairement à beaucoup de collections qui sont des collections thématiques, euh, qui soit sur un format, sur un, une période, sur un type d'objet, euh, ou même, euh, euh, soit, ou, je parle des objets, ça peut être sur des films, euh, la particularité de la collection, c'est qu'elle est un petit peu emblématique euh, et représentative de la production mondiale euh, de tous les temps. Alors, elle est, pas, elle est plus exhaustive que dans certains cas, par exemple, pour des pays qui ont produit beaucoup au niveau des États-Unis. On est de ce côté-là de l'Atlantique, donc c'est plus facile euh, d'avoir accès, d'une part, à cause des coûts de transport qui sont gigantesques dès qu'on parle d'équipements euh, de projection, parce qu'ils sont très lourds, d'autant plus que s'ils sont sonores, hein, pour M. Lacasse, alors il y en a beaucoup, des, app des appareils sonores, mais effectivement... Euh, mais euh, en ce qui euh, concerne l'intérêt de la collection, euh, ici, euh, ici au Québec, c'est qu'il y a environ 30 à 40 de l'équipement de la collection qui n'a jamais été vendu en Amérique et, encore, et, et souvent qui n'a jamais été vendu au Québec. Donc euh, cet aspect-là de l'avoir ici à l'université, euh, c'est quelque chose qui est... On n'est pas obligé d'aller à Amsterdam ou à Paris pour, ou dans un musée à Paris ou à, ou à Potsdam pour voir euh, ces équipements. Maintenant, euh, c'est sûr qu'il y, y en a beaucoup, beaucoup, beaucoup qui ne sont pas là parce que même euh, dans des collections, que ce soit les cinémathèques françaises ou, euh, ou ailleurs, ou des collections privées en Europe, ils ont eu accès plus, facile au, plus facilement à l'équipement. Et là, souvent, je vois de l'équipement que j'aimerais bien avoir, que je pourrais acheter en France, 
Mais quand je vois l'équipement et le coût de transport, euh, ça, ça devient une impossibilité. Disons, à court terme, il faudrait une organisation qui soit assez conséquente. Bon. Germain, euh, l'équipement cinématographique sonore, il y a de quoi faire un colloque sans aucun problème. Merci. Il y a juste à décider les dates. Je peux ajouter que, que les musées en Allemagne, ils ont beaucoup d'appareils de, de son, régissement de, de son, oui. Ouais. Parce qu'ils étaient les premiers en Europe hein, pour le, le, la sonorisation des films. OK. Uh, we, we have officially run out of time, but I'm going to... I think I can maybe take a couple of minutes more because it's, it's fair to the speakers. Uh, who've got us started. And um, I have a question I'd like to address to both contributors, but I don't want to use up anyone else's time. So I'm looking around to see. Now is the moment to raise your hand if you want to uh, intervene. I love the French word intervention, because for, <laughs> to an Anglophone, it sounds like I'm intervening, but it's the normal word for making a contribution. Okay, well, let me address my, my, my question then to, to both, because I think it really actually goes back to Dave's first point, which is, what is the value of being able to touch and handle the equipment? I think this is the question which this whole event circles around. What difference does it make if you, as an ex-curator, uh, <laughs> now an academic, and you, as a, an academic who began in conventional academic fashion, if I may say so, yeah. but you're moving closer to the objects. Yeah. So what is the value? Can you be precise or evocative? What is the value of being able to touch and handle the equipment? Wait, wait. Uh, ben pour moi, c'est un peu ce que j'ai ex exposé au début. C'est vraiment comme uh, une expérience différente. Si je compare avec ma méthodologie, moi, je travaille avec des journaux, jadis des microfilms aujourd'hui, des journaux disponibles en ligne, mais je suis assis pendant des heures à repérer les articles que mon logiciel de reconnaissance de caractère me suggère. Puis j'en vois d'autres qui ne l'ont pas vu et que moi, je trouve. Bon. Mais, mais je n'ai pas d'appareil devant moi. Euh, quand on parle de, de ce projecteur Aladdin, je ne l'ai jamais vu. Je l'ai juste vu dessiner dans une revue. Euh, si on parle de... Il y avait à Montréal un, un photographe assez connu qui, dans les années 20 qui s'appelait Gary Epi, qui faisait des photographies de patrimoine, des, des vieilles maisons, des paysages. Mais personne ne le sait, mais ce monsieur-là, il vendait, il louait, euh, il distribuait du matériel de projection, lanterne magique et projecteur. Il était, il était concessionnaire du cosmographe pour le, la région de Montréal. Euh, mais un cosmographe, j'en ai jamais vu. <rire> j'en ai pas vu. Peut-être qu'il y en a un dans la collection. Bon. Euh, mais mais c'est ça. Hier, ce qui me fascinait, hier et avant-hier, c'est de pouvoir euh, manipuler les appareils. Est-ce que c'est lourd? Est-ce que c'est difficile? Puis, puis finalement, je vois que la, la, la technologie de l'époque était peut-être pas très complexe. Mais son, sa manipulation exigeait beaucoup, beaucoup de, de, de compétences, d'expérience. De, Ce n'est pas une machine qu'on pouvait faire fonctionner facilement la première fois. Un, un, un projecteur et des scènes, même si ça ressemble à une machine à coudre, c'est beaucoup plus compliqué que ça. Il y a la, puis, puis, puis à l'époque, il n'y avait même pas le son. Le son, c'était le conférencier dans la salle qui s'en occupait. Donc, quand je parle d'historien en situation d'évocation dynamique, c'est qu'on ne peut pas, on, 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 on réussira jamais à recréer le passé. Hein? Euh, L'astrophysicien qui est mort il n'y a pas longtemps, comment il s'appelait l'anglais euh, infirme? Euh, Hawking. Hawking disait, euh, s'il existait une machine à voyager dans le temps, ça fait longtemps que les voyageurs du temps seraient venus nous voir. Ce n'est pas arrivé. Je ne pense pas que ça va arriver non plus. Euh, mais on, ça, on ne peut pas reconstituer le passé, on peut l'évoquer, mais le, le, ce que l'historien cherche à faire, c'est l'évoquer de la façon la plus significative possible. 
Donc, euh, et, et si j'écrivais un livre à partir d'articles de journaux, de découpures, de, de, de citations, de, de livres, de photographies, mais que jamais j'aurais pu toucher à, à ces objets-là, il me semble qu'il me manque un bras, il va manquer deux, deux chapitres dans mon livre. Il y a une expérience de la, de, la, de la tactilité, de la physicalité, de la matérialité que j'aurais pas. Et, et ce colloque est génial pour cet aspect-là, parce que euh, je ne deviendrai pas un opérateur de, 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 de pâté coque de je ne sais pas quelle année. Euh, bon. mais, mais au moins d'avoir pu voir les appareils, les manipuler, les prendre, pas juste avoir quelqu'un qui me les montre avec des gants blancs, puis regarder, il y a ceci. Bon, euh, c est, c est les, les musées qui ne veulent pas que les gens touchent, là, ils devraient faire des répliques à l'identique, c'est facile à faire. Aujourd'hui, avec les machines qu'on a, on peut imprimer des... des des copies de, de projecteurs anciens, si on veut. Ils pourraient au moins nous permettre de, 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 de toucher des répliques et de voir comment ça marchait et qu'est-ce que ça permettait de faire. Et, et, et il y a d'autres conférences à venir dans le colloque. Euh, Paul Moore va nous parler des, des, des difficultés du transport des, des appareils. Euh, bon, c'est des, 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 des contraintes physiques auxquelles étaient exposés les gens qui faisaient le métier de conférencier ambulant. Et il y a des gens qui ont fait ça pendant 40 ans, 50 ans. Alors, c'est des contraintes qu'il devait affronter et qui permettent à l'historien de comprendre quelle était la difficulté de ce métier à cette époque. Voilà. Euh, le passé devient plus complexe, voilà. plus solide. Ah. Oui, merci. Hein? Uh, I see it as a kind of uh, experimental archaeology hmm. to, uh, to touch the objects, but also to get in touch with the methods. Ah. Uh, the first cinema um, pioneers were used, yeah. uh, as we see the, the complexity of, of some of these first movies, and where they're made with these rather primitive cameras, it's unbelievable, yeah. without a reflex viewer, uh, yep. and, and so on. The, the manipulation of, of, the, of the handle, yeah. uh, and, and so on, it's an experience we, we never had. Even when I was a curator, I didn't dare to touch <laughs> to touch the, the objects. It was forbidden also. Ah, yes. 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 Yeah. Well, thank you very much, uh, both very much for your personal reflections on what the, the value of touching is, because I think, uh, I think we're going to be hearing a lot about this. Um, Let's keep in touch. <laughs> <laughs> well said. <laughs> thank you. Okay.